Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight on this cold, windy night. My name is Jack Belcher. I'm the CIO in Arlington County. Uh, and this is the seventh issue of this uh, event, Digital Destiny. And the idea behind it is to invite you, the community of Arlington, to come to an event and talk about what the future might look like. We have no agenda here. So whatever we come up, say anything you want. Talk about what you think the future may look like. There's a microphone here you can come up and talk to. This is being streamed on live, live through Facebook. Uh, and those online can ask questions, and mo we'll monitor those questions, and we'll pose those to the panelists as uh, time allows. Uh, this, again, is a great event. It's the six events we've done prior to this have been extraordinary events in terms of the dialogue we've had. Why we're doing this is that the pace of change is happening at such a rapid, rapid rate that what we assumed to be true today may be changed tomorrow. And there are so many good things that are coming out of it. Harriet Brown is here today. And Harriet, <clears throat> if you thought five years ago that you would pick up your, your tablet or phone and ask for a ride from a total stranger, get in that car to have them take you to the airport, take a plane ride to St. Louis, get out of, that, get out of, your, get out of the airport, take another stranger's car ride to a house you had no idea whose house it was, but you're going to spend the next two days there. Would you think you'd ever do that five years ago? <clears throat> That's Uber. That's Uber, Airbnb. It's changed just about everything we're doing. That's the good side. But there's also not so good side. My wife Nancy's here today with Harriet, and she's sitting there. And Nancy got up the other day, and she said, I want to take the dog for a walk. And she called her. The dog's name is Max. And she says, Max, let's go for a walk. I wonder what the weather's going to be like today. And all of a sudden, the voice came out of the background. Hi, this is Alexa. <laughs> it's supposed to be kind of windy today and kind of cold. Nancy said, shut up, Alexa. I don't want to hear any more. <laughs> Alexa said to her, you know, that's not a nice way to talk to me. <laughs> Nancy walked out of the house, and she said, what else does Alexa know about what I'm doing in the house? <laughs> so the not good side. So in a few minutes, we're going to have that discussion. And we'll talk all about that and what it means. But first, we are so honored. We have the vice chair of the county board here today to talk to us, Christian Dorsey. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, beautiful. You know, I'm one of those people, and I think this is working. I'm one of those people who tends to embrace technology. But you know, when you hear Jack put it in those plain terms, I'm really not sure that I ought to. But one thing I did learn a long time ago is never put Alexa in your bedroom, all right? So make sure. <laughs> That is not a part of your routine. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight, those assembled in person and those who are watching on Facebook Live. It is terrific that you all are here to join in what will promise to be another great discussion on Arlington's digital destiny. Uh, I was fortunate enough to attend a talk earlier in the series on the future of learning and the insights that we were able to get from the community conversation have definitely shaped my thinking and I think have informed uh, thinking throughout the uh, organization of Arlington County government, of course, our Arlington County schools. And, you know, like Jack said, that conversation didn't result in any 10-point plan that we went out, at, went out and started to execute. But it did do the necessary work of really evolving how we think of embracing technological change so that it provides opportunities in the future ones that we can't fully articulate or comprehend now, but that we as an organization, we as a county and a community, will be fully prepared to capitalize on. And I am sure tonight's conversation on uh, shaping a smart and secure future will provide equally valuable insights to us all. Now, you all may know, because we brag about it a lot, Arlington has been named the top digital county in the United States for uh, two years in a row. And this is the result of many, many factors, uh, some of which I don't even really understand. But I imagine, I imagine at the core, they have focused on some of the smart innovations that we have deployed in recent years. One great example of this is the intelligent transportation system, which on its surface provides the ability for <clears throat> people who are operating in a central location here in this building to monitor our roads, to look at congestion, to look at traffic incidents, to look at flow, 
and to adapt our signaling system to better manage it and to ease the flow of people through our community. Most people have no idea that it's going on, but it provides tremendous benefits, benefits that we can measure, but also many benefits that are unseen. But the great part about this technology is that particular innovation is not the only result, the only end result of those investments. Just like a tree that branches out, that project was able to expand to allow uh, police and fire to open up ports that have enabled them to connect with the county infrastructure so that we can have better responses to emergencies or dealing with large scale uh, crowd events. It's also allowed for the completion of Connect Arlington, which is one of our signature initiatives, the dedicated high speed fiber network that links up the county facilities with the schools, providing much greater network reliability, cost efficiencies for Arlington taxpayers, and uh, just tremendous advantage over what was our a system of, of working with other providers. But we're also taking this approach, this approach to technology and this approach to data, and trying to see how we can deliver all government better. And one of those signature initiatives is our Open Government Initiative, which at its core is about making uh, data, making information more transparent to our public. Now, in its most simplest form, you can easily dump lots of data on your public and call yourself transparent. That's really not what the end game is about, at least as far as I'm concerned. You know, for us, I think we need to work to reach the next level, where we're not just interested in disseminating data sets, but really changing our mindsets and really thinking about how we as a local government recognize that our goal should be to create an active, engaged, and informed citizenry that can in turn help us make the best decisions for everybody's behalf. Now, I, I realize that the nature of a conversation where we don't have the 10-point plan that's gonna come out of it, and we're not really sure what's going to be discussed, can sometimes be very daunting for local governments who by their nature are very risk averse and necessarily concerned with being good stewards of taxpayer resources. Getting into an initiative, getting into an area where the end goal is not clearly defined can sometimes cause lots of consternation. And that leads many local government organizations to sometimes just doing nothing or doing as little as possible, dying by inertia. But I think the traditional risk reward analysis that leads to that kind of thinking is fundamentally flawed. I believe that organizations that, that really plan for and build the capacity in advanced analytics, who build the capacity in data visualization and systems architecture, these will be the local government organizations that are best poised to engage with their community in a way that will lead to better decision making. And when you consider that being the reward, to me, all of the risks are very much worth it. Now, I thank you all for participating in this conversation tonight. Again, I don't know the outcome, but I know that it's going to be incredibly illuminating for me as a public policy person, for our staff who is in charge of implementing, and for all of us who will learn from the conversation with each other. So thank you all tonight, and I look forward to joining you in the audience and hearing from this great panel. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Christian. <laughs> thank you so much. So tonight we're gonna to talk about shaping Arlington's future, our community, and making it a secure and safe community and what the potential may look like. And so we're honored tonight to have Ms. Beverly Allen here today. Beverly is a security consultant for over 20 years to public, private, sector of uh, organizations. She also is the host and producer of a show on WERA-FM. We're proud of that as part of Arlington Independent Media, and she does that. And she was just named uh, Arlington Independent Media is 2017 Radio Producer of the Year. Congratulations. So Beverly's gonna lead. There are microphones here. If you wanna ask a question, I'm told by Beverly, Feel free to just stand up and ask at any point. Just go to the microphone, introduce yourself, and ask the question. With that, Beverly. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for being here. And thanks to our panelists, our esteemed panelists, 
uh, Dr. Joe Pelton, Bob Duffy, and Dr. Indu Singh. And so we're just going to jump right in. And as I ask these questions, gentlemen, please take the opportunity to talk a little bit about yourselves and your background. And my question starting off for each of you is, what do you consider to be a smart city? What are your criteria for smart city? Joe. Well, I'm, I have a few slides. I promise we won't be uh, having a, a slideshow presentation. Um, but um, the thing is, smart cities have changed over time. Back in 1975 and 1976, when I was uh, president of the Arlington County Civic Federation, I was pleased to be a member of what was called the a, a long-range uh, uh, county improvement commission, uh, which was headed by uh, Dr. Joe Holy and Dr. Joe Fisher, who were on the county board then. And there were nine of us, and we basically focused on what became known as smart planning, and the whole idea of concentrating uh, density along the RB corridor, or in the bullseyes of the metro, and what have you. And today, that has blossomed and succeeded, and I think uh, we have 85% uh, of the density in the population concentrated in 15% of the county uh, along the, uh, the metro corridors uh, in uh, RB Corridor and Crystal City. Uh, as time moved along, uh, we started to think increasingly about uh, infrastructure and what does that mean and how do we have smarter infrastructure and also how can we use intelligence, uh, something called SCADA. Who here knows the word SCADA? Well, this is a very informed audience. Uh, that stands for Supervisory Control and uh, uh, Data Acquisition. And uh, when I was on the IT Commission, uh, we uh, were working with the other parts of the county concerned with security and said, are these uh, industrial control systems that control our traffic lights, our water, our sewage, are they protected? And we found out, no, they weren't as protected as they should be. And so we created a new system to consolidate the control and to update the security and the uh, annual audit of that system. So uh, actually, Indu and I have written some three books together. I brought them along from Future City, Safe City. Uh, we're working on a smart city right now. And uh, what I'm going to run through here is where we think we are today in terms of what we mean by a smart city. And uh, so uh, number one, fulfilling citizens' needs. Uh, and there we're talking about education, healthcare, housing, transportation, community needs, and also digital equity. Uh, sustainability, in other words, increasingly uh, we, through our AIR program here in Arlington, we have been focusing on uh, the sustainability of uh, the community and uh, smart energy, what have you. And then jobs and competitiveness, citizen support, and uh, that's very, very important. Uh, I think that Arlington is different. The so-called Arlington Way, which uh, was very much alive uh, back uh, when I was uh, chair of the C Civic Federation uh, 35 years ago, and it's still very much today. I see many uh, uh, Civic Federation leaders uh, out there in the audience. Um, and I would just note that also AIM, uh, it plays a vital role, and uh, I'll just put a, a little commercial in here. AIM funding is very important uh, <laughs> to, to <laughs> So uh, the uh, infrastructure and resources. Increasingly, we are going to be talking about, and Bob's going to be talking about this further, about s uh, smart uh, transportation, uh, smart utilities, smart infrastructure. Uh, but then there's also the issue of technology and AI, and uh, artificial intelligence and algorithms will increasingly run the smart infrastructure. And what will be very critical is what's called human-machine interface, mm -hmm. that we must get that right, that uh, machines do what they're told to do by algorithms, and sometimes that might not be the right thing to do if uh, a uh, 
techno-terrorist uh, seizes control of the com command systems. So uh, we'll be talking further about uh, uh, technology and AI and how it can help us on one hand, but how we have to be protective of our security on the other. And that finally brings us to security. Uh, Indu is a great security. Uh, uh, he's done training uh, for people all over the world in cybersecurity, and he's also done a lot of work uh, uh, around the world in terms of designing smart cities. So we're very pleased to have uh, uh, Indu with us uh, tonight. So uh, just a couple of more slides. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we have all of this new technology, uh, artificial intelligence and super automation. It is amazing that we have gone from terabytes to exabytes to zettabytes, and now we're even building facilities that have a yottabyte uh, capability. And uh, if you know what all of those terms mean, you probably know too much about uh, information <laughs> technology. Uh, but uh, we're certainly talking about smart energy grids, uh, talking bots, uh, driverless transports, the uh, internet of everything. You've heard about the uh, internet of uh, things, but uh, there's a projection by one uh, company that's uh, sort of owned by Intel that says that the amount of internet of thing traffic will increase by a factor of 30 times the next 20 years. And that, that means that most of the communications that will be flying over the internet will be machine-to-machine -machine communications. Uh, and uh, this leads us to the need for advanced cybersecurity, uh, human-machine interface that I mentioned before, and that's putting humans in the middle of uh, uh, commands of uh, very important uh, uh, intelligent infrastructure to make sure that things don't go violently wrong. And then finally, telecity architecture and virtual companies. And certainly teleservices, uh, that will be a key part of uh, that future. So uh, do we have one last thing? And that is the benefits of better planning and growth, less pollution and reduced uh, energy consumption, uh, better infrastructure, less commuting and better transportation systems, reduced traffic accidents, uh, responsive government, but the concerns are uh, cyber attack, uh, techno-terrorism, industrial controls, and the human uh, machine interface. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bob. John, thank you very much. And a uh, little background about me, if you don't know, over the last six years, I've been serving as Arlington's planning director. And I work many with planning commission, with many of our boards and commissions that have been focused on Arlington's smart growth journey, as we like to call it which really is a foundation uh, for our smart county and some of the issues and opportunities we're gonna talk about tonight. Uh, so what I wanna do is give a little history, a little background. This gentleman beside me is, was very involved in the early days of planning and some landmark decisions that were made by our county board and uh, many of the citizen planners. Uh, so I'm gonna give us a little background to start with and then talk about several uh, areas that are central to physical planning and the future of smart growth and of being a smart county that John touched on. But let look, let's look back to the early 60s and 70s and where were we? And a lot of you know what Arlington County was like during that period, a very different place from what's transpired over the last several decades. We had declining retail corridors. Our employment and office market was very different. Uh, we were not unlike many, United, any, many cities in the United States in terms of dominated by the automobile. We didn't have the same types of mobility that we enjoy today. So we were a very different place. And some, some landmark decisions were made again by citizen planners, the planning commission, professional planners, and the county board at the advent of Metro. For example, in the roslyn Balson corridor was shown here, and this is a segment of our general land use plan, which is kind of like our constitution, if you will, in terms of establishing policy and a framework to guide growth. And that policy and framework's been recognized nationally many times, but most recently uh, it was recognized by the American Planning Association uh, for our commitment to smart growth and plan implementation. Uh, but a decision was made in the Roslyn-Balston corridor uh, in the late 70s 
to relocate the metro line from the middle of I-66 to the Roslyn, Boston, Clarendon, uh, certainly corridor, and that had a major impact and really started us down this smart growth journey that's made a difference and again sets this foundation. And we've achieved a lot during that period. It's staggering when you think about where we've come from over just those 40 some years. And this slide shows where we were in 70 and where we are today in the Roslyn Boston quarter in terms of office space, residential, retail, and jobs. It's a tremendous success story. And again, as John indicated, it really set the stage for where we go next. So as we build on our success in terms of smart growth and beginning, continuing our planning as a smart county, uh, there are four things that we need to think about. Autonomous mobility, the future of the workplace, and it's transforming right now. Retail, as we move from Main Street to online, on demand, and on time. And most importantly, how we're going to plan with all of you uh, in the future in an engaged and very dynamic way, <laughs> very different than the planning work that we've done in the past. Now, there are a number of other areas that we could cover here. Martha Moore is here this evening. We were talking about health care. <laughs> We were talking about uh, certainly affordable housing, which is a major priority for the county. But these are four that I think are central and should figure into our ongoing commitment to being a smart community. We're very fortunate in Arlington, as we've held true to our general land use plan, that our master transportation plan that Jenna, Dennis Leach and his staff uh, work on with the transportation board has really been very forward thinking and focused on mobility in a very diverse way that many American communities didn't in the 70s or 80s we were planning for metro. Walkability, uh, various alternative ways to move about, to reduce congestion, uh, reduce the amount of space devoted toward parking, and certainly roads. But this notion of the future of autonomous vehicles is gonna change dramatically in many ways. While it may take time, but at least by 2021, we're gonna find that every major automotive uh, company is introducing some form of semi or autonomous vehicle that's gonna be on our roadways. And a number of them are being tested. I've got an example here of the University of Michigan Circulator that's an autonomous vehicle that moves, uh, moves students and faculty from place to place along the, the large uh, metro campus. Arlington continues to be a participant and a very active part of the discussion about autonomous vehicles and what that will mean to communities. There's a document here that the American Planning Association just recently published based on a symposium that was held uh, here in the fall that involved uh, the, uh, again, the American Planning Association, Brookings, uh, Mobility Lab, uh, the uh, George Mason University was very involved with this. We'll provide a link to this, I think, after the program, but it is a major primer, I think, that will tell us a lot about where we need to go in the future. John mentioned the <laughs> office market, which is changing dramatically from where it was in the 70s, 80s, even the 90s. We all know we went through the Base Relocation Act and sequestration. We have an aging office plant, aging office stock in our communities, uh, and we're gonna need to find new solutions to adapt that space. But again, as new office space comes online, it's radically different, and the space is smaller. Uh, it's, it's, it's designed to enable collaboration and innovation in a way that much of the previous construction in Arlington uh, really uh, wasn't, hadn't considered. Even this building is going to be part of that revolution. We're about, we're going to be in this building for another 15 years due to renewal of our lease. But through that lease negotiation, we're going to be redesigning the interior of this building so that the services we deliver to all of you build on the digital opportunities that we have and make us work smarter, be innovative, and more collaborative. And you'll hear more about this <coughs> in the weeks and months ahead. Retail is changing dramatically. Uh, several years ago, our Arlington Economic Development Office 
uh, stepped back and worked with us on developing a new retail strategy that changed how we look at ground level retailing across Arlington County and its uh, various metro corridors and stops. Uh, we all know that grocery stores alone, how they're delivering and serving their customers is changing dramatically. How that will affect Arlington County's grocery store policy. And again, this whole change from bricks and mortar retail to on time and on demand is going to be dramatic in the years ahead. And lastly, I want to talk briefly, and I know we'll talk more about this, is smart planning, which is further engaged and dynamic. There's a copy here on the screen of the Boston Sector Plan, which is our plan for the quarter and a half a mile area that surrounds the Boston Metro Station. It's one of our older plans developed back in the 1980s. And we need to begin to update those plans, but in a very different way. It has smart city components that John defined and also utilizes the data from a wide range of sources so that our, so that our uh, so that the forecasts that we develop for these plans can be more dynamic, recognize that change is so rapid that we may need to change our tactics, our zoning procedures, policies, to implement the basic goals and vision that we establish for each of these planning areas. And again, one area where the county is moving forward is through the One Stop Arlington program. It's really going to transform how we service all of you in terms of issuing permits, providing a new level of customer service, and providing for a new uh, uh, electronic set of plan reviews and submission that's something we haven't experienced before. So our county is gearing up both in terms of the space and in terms of the services we deliver. And so what I want to do briefly tonight before we have our conversation is give you a little overview of where we've come from, <clears throat> press upon you how important our smart growth journey has been, the difference it's made, and how it will contribute to our smart county. So our journey is going to continue, and again tonight we'll have some conversations about that. Thanks. Into. Okay, so I'll take a shortcut because they have covered almost everything that you need to know about a smart city. But you know, for the last 15 years I have been designing building a smart cities all over the world, except here at home. Um, we're just starting now, while the rest of the world has been building smart cities for the last 15 years. My first project was Singapore uh, government project called Intelligent Island, which is still the best... Can you do a little bit louder? Which is still the best model of a smart city. Okay, can you hear me now? All right. So, um, I was talking to Dr. Pelton last week, and he gave me some statistics about Arlington County, which I think Made me, led me to conclude that Arlington is already a smart city. He told me that there are more smart people living in Arlington <laughs> County than in any other county or cities in Washington metropolitan area. So there you go. Unfortunately, I live in Fairfax County, so. Uh, I, I think we're talking about move. educational attainment. <laughs> <laughs> but, but to me, because somebody who designs and builds a smart city, I have, a, I have simplified the definition because Every city defines a smart city, and every country defines a smart city in its own way. And that's fine, because there are different stages of growth. But a common definition to me when I design is that a smart city is an economic development concept, socioeconomic development. It's not a technology. I'm a technologist, okay? But it is not a technology concept. And I have seen the failure of smart cities in many countries with the smart people leading it, because they overemphasize technology and underemphasize the socioeconomic development. Because that's what you are using technology, which is a means to an end, and end is economic development. So to me, that's a smart city. Everything is built around socioeconomic development using advanced information and communication technology. So technology has a very important place, but it's a conduit to something. It is not actually, just buying all these technology doesn't make a county or the city smart. I can tell you that. That's my concept. So Dr. Singh, Indu, oh, thank you for got Mar Martha Moore. Hi, I'd like to broaden the topic a little bit. Uh, I'm on the Information Technology Advisory Commission. And several years ago during one of our minor emergencies, 
uh, we raised the issue of crowdsourcing. And it was very interesting that what my question is, what is the role of the people who live and work here? It seems to be pretty passive. We're supposed to wait for you to tell us what to do. Well, I'm currently watching a series on TV, it's purely fictional, about crowdsourcing. I don't know if anybody's familiar with this, but it's kind of like Fahrenheit 451, where people have smartphones mm -hmm. and they're willing to help you do whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. Get the bad guy, or in our case, it was somebody put, put up a website that said, this gas station is open, they have electricity, and they have gas. And people wanted to know things like that, but we, Arlington, were a little bit suspicious of having people we didn't know who had not yet been vetted. And so I'm I have been very curious since then about what is the role People will want to come and help. There's no doubt about that. And what are other communities doing about that? Well, you actually, those questions are on the agenda. And by the time we get done with this uh, series, this forum in the series, uh, hopefully we will have answered all the questions you just asked. So before we do that, I'm going to stick a pin there because I want Dr. Singh Indu uh, framed this so well that we, we really ought not to get caught up in the technology of it because at the heart of it, it's really about socioeconomics. That being said, I'm still going to ask you, what are some technologies we can expect to see in smart cities? Of course, uh, you know, the technologies are important to be without the technology, we couldn't do most of the things, there is no doubt. Um, what I was trying to say is that technology should not be the sole purpose, adopting te new technology. But you will see a lot of technology that is already, but the technology, technology is something that we really need to learn today, okay? It used to take 14, 15 years for a new technology to move out of the, the R&D lab and come to the consumer market. Today, it takes less than two years. So technologies are rapidly changing. And there is a cultural lag in using the technology as they are progressing rapidly and our ability to use them cannot be equally fast. So that's the problem. But having said that, in a smart city, you, got, you have to think differently. The smart city, when we design a smart city, is a solution looking for problems. Right? You don't build a smart city without really defining your issues and solutions. Arlington is a case in point, for example. You know, it, Arlington is in transition. I mean, with the Crystal City changes happening there, you know, Roslyn changes happening there, the traffic. If a smart city, Arlington smart city can solve 66, tra 66 traffic problem, I'll be happy to, you know, to know that we have achieved this smart city in Arlington, right? So what we have to be very innovative, and there are new technologies that are coming in that people are using. For example, um, just yesterday, Dubai announced that it's going to be the first government in the world that will be powered by blockchain technology by 2020, okay? Now everybody's talking about blockchain technology, and the Bitcoin, the foundation for Bitcoin is the blockchain, right? Blockchain technology in a smart city holds a great promise. What is Dubai going to do? That is going to move all of his central record of property, properties, and put it on, on the, the blockchain. And the blockchain, basically fundamentally blockchain technology is a secure database that allows multiple computers to share the same information. But what will happen as a result of that, that the properties can be transferred faster, easier, and cheaper. Look at how much you pay for the, the title search and change when you buy something or sell something. There is no reason why it should take that long. And the county can transfer all the record on those technologies. So, so it's not the technology to answer your question directly. It isn't the technology that is driving a smart city implementation. It's the application, innovation and application and services. So when you design or you develop the plan for, from a smart growth to a smart city, 
we have to look at innovation in application and services using the new technology. So that's, that's where the real challenge is going to be in my viewpoint in a smart city. So, so we're really talking quality of life. Is that what we're hearing? Absolutely. It's about improving yes. quality yeah, of life fine. for citizens. See another question? Yeah. Sure. I'm actually on the Information Technology Advisory Commission myself. Uh, my name is Joshua Farah. Uh, in regards to the specific question um, about like the timeline and what types of problems we're interested in solving, um, you know, I think there's going to be a, a long-term, obviously, a multi-year rollout of different types of technologies. Uh, I work in the analytics industry, and so what we're really interested in is capturing information. So um, I don't know if there are really any sort of like government-specific data specifications yet. I know NIST has been working on some things, but I mean, in terms of what's coming, we have to figure out how to measure things first. That is really the most important question. So, you know, I, it's good to see uh, uh, programs come out like open data initiatives where we're actually producing uh, data from systems. It's not perfect um, because, again, we don't have those analytic systems, but as w the idea is that as we develop some of these solutions, whether it's a traffic coordination or signaling system or uh, some sort of like, you know, market uh, allocation system, um, you know, really we're trying to uh, build a data-centric view of the world, um, solve some problems with the data-centric view, find out, uh, as we're solving the problem, where some of the other interesting problems lie, and using that uh, feedback to um, basically further instrument the system so that we can further optimize outcomes. C can I respond to that? Sure, absolutely. Uh, just uh, first by way of information, uh, Indu and I and a team of other people and uh, uh, several universities have a proposal into the National Science Foundation to do some of the things that you're uh, talking about and to develop the, the methodology. Uh, many people here know about big data and uh, big data analysis. What we're doing is trying to go a step beyond that to what we call causal analysis to create a model of how a city works and its relationships and then test big data uh, and run it through very high speed computers to say, do these relationships uh, affect uh, and what are the best investments that have worked to achieve various objectives uh, in the past so that when the county board uh, looks at its budget, it knows what are the most cost effective investments uh, uh, for capital and also operating budgets. Uh, so we're in the process of uh, hopefully getting that, but what's interesting is that we have three uh, cities that are participating in this. Uh, one is Arlington County, uh, the other one is uh, up in Rhode Island, uh, and uh, then in uh, Colorado. Uh, so three parts of the country and three different uh, communities. Uh, but uh, also I wanted to just comment on uh, Martha's uh, question about the thing is <clears throat> there are certain applications that the government should be involved in and can do uh, for crime prevention, for instance, uh, create a system so that people can feel that they can report crimes and uh, a suspicious uh, behavior and that there's be a better uh, structured way for that to happen. There is already a system that uh, Jack Belcher in the Department of Transportation System has that people can uh, actually take a picture of potholes and what have you and then send that into the county. And that's a system that's, that's already operating. Uh, but a lot of the other things don't necessarily involve the, the county per se. In other words, there are things that communities can do, universities can do, or other uh, groups within a community can do on a private basis. And I do think going forward, we're going to see many more private uh, uh, governmental partnerships in, in systems. But uh, I think in terms of crime and reporting, uh, you know, road hazards and other things, those are things that are already starting to happen and there's more the county should be examining going forward uh, how to use crowdsourcing and other things that private initiatives can do as well. Just can to I add one? Go ahead. No, you go ahead, please. Uh, so, you know, I think, like I said before, the different cities have different reasons for building a smart city. There are about 50 cities across America right now that is at various stages of smart city implementation. Most are in the very beginning. Detroit just announced a new RIP came out to develop a smart city strategy, for example. But there is a trend that is happening which is very disturbing. 
And, and if you see in the 70s and 80s, we talk about rich community and poor community. Then we talk about information rich and information poor. And now what, uh, what we see is happening is what I call the rich city and poor city, mm -hmm. OK? And, and, and what we find that the bigger cities, bigger cities, big urban areas are really booming in America. And the small cities and the small towns and rural counties are really struggling, OK? Which is a very bad trend. And, and so I think the way to think about now is, how do we really bring these struggling cities back to a normal level so that they can compete and thrive in their own way? Could a smart city be a vehicle for that? Yes. Because the smart city has the flexibility that you can design and build for any purpose to your strategic advantage. That's what you do. Uh, and, and, and so, like, you know, if you, if you look at these statistics, it's startling. Between 2010 and 2014, 50% of the new business were formed in the United States in 20 counties. 50% of the business formed only in 20 counties in the United States. What does that mean to the rest of the countries and the cities? Demographic changes, people are leaving, economy going down, tax base going down, and, and we are not paying attention to those things. But those cities, why is, think about it, why is Detroit all of a sudden wants to be a smart city? There is a reason for that, economic development competitiveness, being able to compete in this world, which is very competitive, right? Either if Arlington doesn't build a smart city, Fairfax will, <laughs> or Baltimore will. Right. Somebody will. So, so, so let me, this is a good point, and Bob, I'm going to give you a chance to <laughs> yeah. respond. I see you on the edge of your seat here. But how many in the audience are comfortable with a concept of smart city? And just by show of hands. Okay. Can so, I ask a follow-up question? Uh, you <laughs> may, but how many people are comfortable with algorithms guiding their lives? Okay. <laughs> okay. So perhaps we can answer that question yeah. later in the discussion. What we're hoping here, and was it Martha who asked the first question, yeah. is that by the time we come to the end of this discussion, you will be able to say to us, "Here is how I can get involved in smart cities." How about that? <laughs> okay. So I am going to ask you, Bob, as the director of planning for the county, there are already some smart technologies at work in Arlington County. For the benefit of, of the folks here who, are, who may not know what those are, can you share two or three of those? Well, again, I talked a little bit about, uh, well, let's go back. Let's talk about civic engagement, community engagement, and planning. You know, if you turn back the clock and you think about how we approached that uh, a decade or more ago, it's all about public hearings. Uh, and it really wasn't about real-time engagement. And today, uh, the community planning work that we do in partnership uh, with, with many of you in, in the neighborhoods and business community uh, really involves some new tools and a wide range of tools involving social media, We've used Periscope, if you have an understanding what that. And no, we, we, have, we have broadened the array of community engagement uh, networks and, and technology, uh, I think, as fast as, as they're coming forward and being introduced into, into planning, uh, into community planning. So that, that's one area that we're, we're very actively involved with. I want to stress what we're, what we're in the process of doing and what we'll be rolling out uh, by the end of this year related to Arlington County's permitting system. Now, issuance of building permits may sound pretty basic, but when you're doing 64,000 building permits every year that involve from basic home improvements to the construction of hundreds of thousands of mixed-use development in Boston or Groslin, uh, it's a big deal. And we're now in the process of working with Excella, uh, and working across departmental lines, because there are many of many different agencies, including ours, the Department of Community Planning, Housing Development, Department of Environmental Services, 
uh, Jack's department, that are all involved in that, that, uh, that permitting process. In 18 to 20 months or less, the, the entryway for that permitting is going to be a digital entry, an application that's online, and the permitting will be online, and all those trips or interaction with various agencies will be all behind the scenes. We are fully going to integrate all of our permitting staff uh, into a pretty seamless structure. So it's some silo busting that's going on, and it's a real transformation that's going to occur. And as I also said, this building is going to be renovated and wired and repositioned to enable those types of transformations to happen. Just a couple of, of areas. Now with that new permitting uh, system, we're gonna be able to track permitting data uh, at a number of scales and be able to link it to our geographic information system, which is our computerized mapping system that's used for a wide range of applications. And we can layer that information up uh, to help us with sound and, and really pretty dynamic planning. So the application of that geographic mapping system, those new sources of data related to permitting, how is, how is a parcel of land changing? Will allow us to rethink how we structure a community plan or a plan for a metro station area so that we can have some real-time analysis and be able to upgrade how we approach implementation of those plans, modify policies supporting implementation of the plan in a very different way. Those are just some basic tools that we use today. But again, as you've heard tonight, uh, the range of digital tools is expanding and uh, in a dramatic way. I'd just like to add one point. One of the great resources Arlington now has is the uh, Connect Arlington fiber optic network mm -hmm. that connects 100 uh, sites, uh, 50 county and 50 schools. And if someone were to ask me what is Arlington not doing that it should be doing, is it should be doing more in terms of telemedicine, telehealth, and teleeducation. Uh, we have spent a huge amount of money on building new schools in Arlington County. We have not given enough thought to how we can use that resource for education and health care and services, and that's uh, one area where I would like to see more progress. All right, so I'm going to ask a really basic question for, since we're talking about quality of life being the underpinning for the smart city intelligence community. Uh, who would like to be able to get from here to Tyson's Corner without, you know, or, or from here to Woodbridge <laughs> without being stuck in traffic or, you know, sitting at a traffic light for two to three minutes when there is no co vehicle coming on the other, on opposing sides? Can we talk about the smart in, in that area that would allow me to get to my shopping without being frustrated when I get there? What are some technologies now that we have in place that we don't even know about as Arlingtonians? Yeah. Other than the flying cars? <laughs> <laughs> or the drones delivering yeah. my pizza. Well, <laughs> well there, there is one thing yeah. about silos. Bob talked about silos within the county, and there are all sorts of problems with silos. But the other silo is that Arlington is one entity, and there's the uh, uh, Fairfax County, and there's uh, Alexandria, and what have you. Uh, I've even proposed the idea that we have a centralized 911 center for the entire region, which would be m much more cost effective, and would also we have a real problem staffing nine, uh, you know, 724, uh, the facility we have. But uh, that's the other problem, is that getting all of these counties to work together. Uh, I think uh, Jack can tell us about the system that now you can, uh, if you're living in Arlington County, but you have a fire uh, and the nearest fire engine is in Fairfax, uh, or you have a crime, uh, it, it will be dispatched from Fairfax. So we do have that going, but uh, there's a lot more we could be doing in terms of traffic management that doesn't exist yet. Well, you mentioned the, that your initial question was about uh, mobility again and travel. And this whole notion of autonomous mobility and autonomous vehicles that, you know, we're all just scratching the surface with and trying to understand what the 
opportunities and challenges will be. I mean, all of you have great power in your smartphones and devices to work with Uber and Lyft uh, that you've never had before in some ways to, uh, to achieve a new level of mobility. But once these new vehicles become online and become integrated as a system, not just in Arlington, but regionally, it's gonna press, it's gonna bring both regional, county, and local planners together to think about how that connectivity of these different types of autonomous mobility are going to, to interact and what the implications will be for our communities. You know, some of the, the great opportunities that they're gonna face it will further address the congestion issue in Arlington, which we have done, I think, an excellent job at in reducing congestion in some of our major thoroughfares through adding layers of new mobility, ensuring those, those types of mobility with Metro are well connected. But the opportunity to further reduce congestion through uh, and reduce and increase safety uh, through autonomous travel uh, again, the, the future of that is just tremendous. That will mean that probably we can rethink how we use a lot of that parking space on our roads and, and some of those right-of-ways if we're moving cars more efficiently and they're moving themselves uh, in a very coordinated and inter, inter, interconnected way. Uh, just think of all the space that's in many of our parking garages today that's underutilized and the opportunity to tap that space because we can have a more holistic approach to how these autonomous vehicles may park themselves. Uh, and uh, so the history is, is the, op the future is really significant. There are also some challenges and think about, well, these autonomous vehicles would introduce a new level of equity for all of us across the region, particularly in rural and suburban areas, to have new means of mobility to travel to activity centers back and forth. And again, as, as the two largest age cohorts in our region in Arlington increase, again, those, uh, that, the, the millennials are certainly the, 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 the uh, that, that age cohort is increasing the fastest, as well as all of us that are uh, 55 and older is also increasing. And they're gonna place, have different market choices and different demands uh, that'll need to be addressed by that transportation as well. So what will that mean for transit in Arlington and the Metro? If you have that new type of, of vehicle, what will it mean to surface transportation uh, for Metro and both art? And those are things that we're gonna to have to think about and utilize our master transportation plan to address. I think this is a good time to engage the audience. If you have questions, how about you step up to the mic and we'll take a few questions before we continue with the program. Come on, be brave. <laughs> she be was, the first. Uh, she was giving a... <laughs> I guess I'm old enough to uh, still like human contact. <laughs> and I don't know anybody, for example, with an Apple computer who says, gee, I wish they'd close those brick and mortar places in Arlington so I could talk to someone in South Dakota about repairing my computer. Uh, it just seems to me that uh, there's something about looking someone in the eye and having them tell you something that's, that's of value and maybe technology will get rid of that. Uh, I hope not. But, you know, Amazon, I, I just have a little anecdote of getting a product from Amazon. Uh, doing something really stupid with it, telling them this doesn't work. They just said, send it back. And they sent me another one as soon as I opened it, I realized what I had done wrong. So Amazon's way of dealing with it is basically to say the customer is right. And, you know, whatever. And that's, not every company, de you know, deals with it that way. Uh, but there's just something frustrating. Uh, about not being able to talk to somebody. It's really a great issue. And again, urban planners, urban designers, all of us enjoy great public spaces, the ability to be on a sidewalk that's active, that faces retail and restaurants. It's one of the hallmarks of what we've achieved through all this smart growth planning over the years. Uh, I don't think that will ever disappear, but it'll probably change. You mentioned Amazon and 
there's a good example where there's probably going to be a hybrid between this on time, online, and on demand with bricks and mortar. Some of you may have read that earlier this week, Amazon opened their first bookstore on M Street in Georgetown, and they're going to open another one in Bethesda. So they're going to have a bricks and mortar present for just what this gentleman indicated, uh, a real face-to-face -face contact, but also linking on demand. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's a retailer uh, down on Wilson Boulevard uh, that uh, its sales, while it has bricks and mortar sales, the number of online sales that they provide their customers is leading the nation. And, and so there's going to be some form of, of hybrid here that we're finally going to get to. And I hope we never replace those face-to-face -face interactions and contacts and, and, and opportunities to, to, uh, to discuss as we're having tonight. I'll just note that Herschel, who asked the question, he got a degree in computer sciences before there were departments of computer sciences. So you're partially responsible, Herschel. <laughs> So that, that's a good point. Could you uh, just say your name when you get ready to ask your question? Thank you. Hi. Uh, Frank Narvaez, so I'm a 38-year resident here in Arlington County. And um, growing up here, I remember the days where, yeah, you, you had face-to-face -face interactions with people here in a small, let's say you needed to get your TV repaired and you just come up to one of the places here in Wilson Boulevard and they would you go in there and you talk to somebody about placing one of the vacuum tubes or something like that. It was uh, interesting times back then, as far as I can remember. But um, it seems like we're we're coming through sort of this. Uh, I mentioned earlier a quantum leap change that's going to occur here in the next few years. And I want to get your perspectives on uh, infrastructure in terms of uh, how can we prepare ourselves from an infrastructure standpoint, and then also from a um, Internet of Things, and maybe you can elaborate on that, but the Internet of Things uh, in the world and how can Arlington County use best use those from an analytics perspective to, to really get to what we need uh, for the county and for the residents? Before we answer that question, is everyone here familiar with the concept of Internet of Things? Who isn't? Just by a show of hands. Okay, so great. Let's launch in. <laughs> well, uh, let me start on Internet of Things, uh, that uh, increasingly almost everything will have some communications uh, capability to report to your car, your uh, toaster, your washing machine, or what have you. And uh, there's one study done by uh, Wind River that projected that uh, uh, increase of 30-fold time the amount of communications that uh, would uh, result uh, from the Internet of Things in just the next 20 years. And uh, that means uh, uh, that uh, between uh, uh, RFID, everyone know that term? In other words, the ability to uh, have sort of a smart inventory and know exactly where all your products are so you don't do uh, uh, audits anymore, inventory control. Uh, that's all automated now. And uh, the thing is, uh, this means that the majority of broadband communications really will be machines uh, talking to machines. And I, I literally have uh, incre created the term uh, in some books I've written called the Internet of Everything, that uh, this will be uh, a great boon for like uh, doing your inventory control or what have you, but it also means that uh, you are exposed to a lot of uh, a potential uh, cyber criminal behavior. So there are even examples of uh, people uh, uh, hacking baby monitors and uh, looking in at babies and uh, uh, a whole host of other things that can be hacked and uh, that uh, most of the uh, uh, distributed denial of service activities actually is by accumulating all of these uh, Internet of Things devices and then being able to send, uh, you know, ter terabytes of information at uh, a uh, thing. Now, 
it is interesting that one of the other aspects of blockchain technology is that also it can defeat uh, uh, the uh, distributed denial of service uh, type of activities. So as almost as everything with technology, there's advantages, there's good things again, and there are bad things. That's why uh, I call my promise and pitfalls that we have to be aware of the pitfalls, that uh, uh, there's the pitfall that uh, Herschel's talking about of losing the human dimension and human interaction, uh, the uh, ability to uh, uh, automate everything means that uh, things could go terribly wrong if a uh, techno-terrorist or a cyber criminal uh, got uh, control of your, your system. So that's why uh, what are called human uh, machine interface activities and how they're designed so that you can put the brakes on technology when something starts to go wrong. So uh, if, when we mentioned RFID, a few people shook their heads, which just means radio frequency identification or radio frequency ID. And it's the same kind of technology that allows you to remotely open your car, for example, right? So we on the set, clear it, good. So give us some examples then just of machine to machine communication just for you know is it our coffee pot talking to you know our alarm clocks what do we mean by that on a practical level and into I'm looking at you doc Oh you are <laughs> okay <laughs> Well I'd rather talk to human to human than machine to machine <laughs> um, <clears throat> Well when you go into an automation phase, that's, that's where we're going, right? Where, and we, when, when you go into Internet of Things, that means you're an interconnecting everything that you use in a simplest form. So take, take a smart house concept, right? Which is also evolving a great deal, and eventually you will have to take that into account when you design and build smart cities with a smart house. Now think about a smart house, right? When Internet of Things comes to the smart house architecture, right, you really have a perfect example of machine-to-machine -machine communications, right? Because your energy is connected to, to uh, and, you know, your Red. appliances, for example, right? Energy supplies, your thermostat will control the appliances. Your iPhone really becomes your command and control, right? You can do anything, actually. You can do most things, right? Now you can control. You can, you know, close and open your curtains in a smart house. You can open the door and, and train your dog to go out and walk and come back. Um, you can, you know, I mean, you can turn on your microwave. You put things in that or oven or anything. So I think when we go into this Internet of Things and Internet of Everything, you're talking about interconnectivity of appliances, right? Right? That's where we are heading. And is there a danger in that? I think there is a danger in everything that we do as human beings. I personally, being in security for so many years, I subscribe to the philosophy that human beings are secured only for nine months. <laughs> and, and insecurity of life begins the day you were born and, and, and it stays with us until we leave this planet Earth. So what is our role then? Our role is to mitigate the risk every day. We, that's what we do. And, and the technology has a very important role to play in that. The technologies are designed in a smart city for communication, for convenience, and for security. With, with citizens' point of view in a smart city, that's what you look for. Is it going to in, enhance your quality of life? Is it going to make your family and your neighborhood more secured? Are you going to have services delivered by the government on time at lower cost, right? These are the things that really motivate cities and counties and the planners like Bob to really invest in the smart city programs. But the machines are going to drive a lot of things, right? That's where we're heading. So the gentleman in brown had a question. Why don't we allow uh, someone else to tell us your name, please? <clears throat> Kyle Innes. Um, lived in Arlington a little over a year now. Um, two questions. Uh, first is, I'd, if either if any of you had any lessons learned from places like Singapore that have taken this fairly extreme on the one hand, 
or from a place like Estonia that has done a lot of work with digital identity and blockchain yes. on the yeah. other hand, mm -hmm. uh, especially as a place like Arlington looks to proceed with a number of different initiatives. And a second thing is, have you seen any change in procurement or capital expenditure as a result of looking at new utility for things like streetlights or for fiber or for whatever it is that you might be, traffic lights that you're looking at new uses for? Maybe so, I'll start with mm -hmm. traffic lights because I've, I was just talking to Jack about that the other day. Well, uh, please, oh, okay, t okay, please tell okay. them about the smart traffic lights we already have in Arlington. Right, that's, Thank right, you. that's right. So <laughs> in other words, we have been, uh, for several reasons, uh, updating the uh, street lighting in Arlington County and replacing them with LED systems that can last for uh, 20 years or longer. Uh, consume less uh, energy and so less pollution, uh, but we also have them smart so that we can uh, have them brightest uh, during uh, the traffic uh, hours and then uh, uh, dim down gradually over the, uh, the evening and then uh, uh, be very low uh, at like uh, one to four in the morning. Uh, and also, we can now command those uh, street lights to become uh, uh, smart uh, uh, Wi-Fi uh, uh, centers uh, and so on for uh, a variety of, of activities for crime control or communications or what have you. So we are well into that system and have been doing this for the last, uh, I think, five years now. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I just want to ask, who noticed a difference in street lights over the last five years? Show of hands. Just a few people. Right. It's interesting. How, however, it's interesting. some people got very upset. They didn't like the, the whiteness of the, <laughs> okay. uh, the glare, and so we had to design some of the systems so that they were shielded from residential areas. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, you know, the technologists, they just look at what we want to do, and then the community has to get involved. And, uh, and the Civic Federation, for instance, recommended that there be a trial implementation in just one part of the community to see if there were problems. Uh, and that wasn't done, and then there were problems. So, so Martha, <laughs> this goes to how does community get involved? How do individuals get involved? Uh, who wants to speak about lessons learned from smart city implementation? Okay. Who wants to tackle that? Yeah, go ahead. So, you know, based on my experience of the uh, last 15 years, um, we we'll learned a lot. You know, uh, the first question that you have to ask, why some smart city projects succeed and others fail? And, and what we have learned that is not the money that makes a smart city fail or succeed. You can put all the capital investment in it and you still not make it. It starts with human imagination, okay? You start there. And the vision, creating the vision for Arlington is smart city, and then converting that to a strategy, leading that to a plan, and then go into implementation. So what we have learned that you create all these things. When I did the Singapore uh, Intelligent Island project, it was implementation, a roadmap and implementation plan was for 15 years. So one, one lesson that we learned that you start small and grow big. A lot of times I have seen, and particularly the the cities and the city leaders will push toward grand ideas, grand plan, grand program, you know, $100 million. No, that's not where you start. The smart city is based on a long-term vision with short-term projects. That's the lesson number one, okay? You start implementing slice by slice, not the whole thing at the same time. The second thing is that from the very beginning, it's very critical. A critical success factor in smart city is to involving the community. I have seen a smart city fail because the communities were told after the whole planning process has been completed, right? That's a no-no. And I won't name the cities where I work. 
But I can tell you that where we work with the cities now, we involve the community first. This is a good way to start. I mean, the digital destiny is nobody's in America doing, no city that I know other than Arlington, okay? I have not been to a single forum. I'm, we're involved in a project right now where we are um, taking a city to the second level of a smart city implementation, right? And the first city, not a single citizen was involved in that. That's, that's not how you succeed. So involving people, lesson number two is involving people is very important. Third is what is happening now in smart city because when you, you know, smart city also means some things will get outdated and there is a cost to that, right? Because investment has been made in that. So what is happening now that the public-private partnership is really driving most of the smart city because people want all the benefits that what they don't want to pay more taxes, okay? And so, the third lesson is that the successful smart cities today is based on public-private partnership. There are places where the private money can come in. Um, there are companies right now that, that invest in a smart city. So they will take over the traffic light, they change, they invest in that X number of years, they have a mechanism to really get return on their investment, and then you own the place. Cities cannot invest in everything. Most cities don't have that much money to really invest. And one of the biggest things that is not happening in our country right now is that federal government is taking no interest, really, to, to really promote and build and design a smart city. Hopefully, hopefully, when we have a trillion dollar infrastructure bill <laughs> and that passes, that'll be the ideal time to really link a smart city project to that because you don't want to just build infrastructure. You want to build intelligent infrastructure that can benefit the community. So those are the things that is happening, I think is going to happen. So if I, I think if I hear you, so one of the things as you said that if we're rebuilding roads, repairing roads, then perhaps that's the time to put sensors in the roads? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Question, sir. Yeah, this... Um, Tell us your name, please. Uh, my name is Trey Gordner. I've been a resident of Arlington for about 18 months now. Uh, moved up here from South Carolina. Anyhow, uh, my question really dovetails nicely off of the public-private partnerships comment. Uh, I've been watching the coverage of Sidewalk Labs in mm -hmm. Toronto mm -hmm. with great interest, um, yes. seeing, for, for context, um, a, a Google subsidiary one a contract to redevelop a portion of Toronto uh, completely as sort of a next generation smart city. Uh, my question is, you know, looking at that, uh, especially in, in looking at public-private partnerships and these proprietary systems, how do we ensure that uh, a smart city is not a privatized city? Great question. Well, there are two answers to your question. First of all, Google just bought 62 acres in Phoenix and they're building a new smart city. So that's a privatized city and that's going to happen. And there is nothing wrong with that, okay? But you have to think about these corporations, they are, they are a center of innovations, right? They develop the technology that are going to be part of a smart city. So if you're Google, you're Microsoft, wouldn't it be smart to buy land, build a smart city, put all of your technology in experiments and showcase. So that's what they are doing. The public-private partnership, and I've been involved in a couple of those for a smart city, cities still can control, even though the money comes from outside, and they should. Because you do not want proprietary technology. You don't want IBM to provide the hardware and software and middleware, everything, and, and design and build your smart city. Then you're stuck with this for eternity. We don't want to do that because smart city is an open architecture. And the city and citizens deserve to have the best technology, doesn't matter where it comes from, and at the cheapest cost. And, and so with the propriety system, you cannot have that. And the thing is, there's another concern on the other side of the coin. If you read what's happening in China, where they have uh, been uh, buying tens of millions of sensors and they did an experiment uh, with a reporter where uh, to locate him as a, quote, uh, criminal, and it took him 
uh, five minutes walking around to be spotted and uh, on the cameras and they knew exactly where, where he was. And part of this new system in China is that they're creating a kind of a, a good citizen social index and what have you and monitoring uh, people's behavior and uh, their uh, interventions online and what have you. And uh, it does seem and sound a lot like Big Brother. So uh, uh, having the government in control versus private in control, uh, it depends on what form of government you have. And uh, uh, I think we should appreciate uh, democracy. Uh, uh, but that's just a, a side comment. You know, one thing I think we need to be careful of, and, and, and you mentioned that I think it's Bill Gates who's now going to build this model smart city in the desert somewhere near, near Phoenix. And as planners, we've seen a lot of experiments like that over the past decades. And, and while we learn things from, from those uh, prototypes and, and those uh, ventures, uh, it's one thing to transfer that into a community like Arlington and a region like ours into an existing city with all its complexities. We talked about the social economic structure uh, and how to integrate this technology so it's fair and equitable and makes a difference for all of us. That's really where some of the challenges are gonna be. We can learn from those new places, learn from private uh, innovation and applications, but how we begin to apply and marry that, I think, to everyday communities and urban life is going to be an interesting thing for us to experience. Yeah. If I can add one more thing, and that's a very good point, but one of the things that is also happening, and I believe in that, that the cities today, for their future development, cities itself have to become innovation center. And Arlington is a good example for that, okay? They have to innovate and re-innovate themselves by taking other people's ideas and technology. And, 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 and that is, some of the cities are doing that. So you go to Rhode Island, where we're working right now in Newport, they have created this, what they call, innovation district, okay? And, and that's basically the 62 acres waterfront property that is going to be a campus environment designed to attract new businesses to come in like the you know, quantum computing is coming and others to really, now look at this, it's a, a city of 24,000 population, it's, it's one of the small, smallest cities in America, can think that big by becoming an innovation center? Yes. Can Arlington become the innovation center in this region? It, it is poised to be because it has all the elements that is needed to, for a city to be an innovation center. I live in Fairfax, I should be biased to that. I think maybe Arlington Chamber of Commerce should hire me. But I think it's a very fitting in Arlington for a lot of regions that you already know. And, and so, so I think there is a need to be engaging in a very innovative thinking if you're going to be building a smart city. It's not just buying the technology and, and looking at five issues that you have and putting them together and say, that's not to me smart city. Smart city is something that brings innovation of ideas. So let's, just, let's just take that innovation to a more of a project <clears throat> or a micro level. And I've got one example that I, I think is, uh, is going to continue to be successful. Bob, take a breath a second here. Certainly. We're, we're running out of time. Okay. So I'm going <clears> to, <throat> if you could do a quick, finish your point quickly, and then we'll do a quick wrap up. Crystal City, office space built in the 1970s, 80s, 19% vacancy rate. How do you fill some of those vacant buildings? One example, 23rd and, and uh, US-1. Uh, former federal office building, now converted to We Work, We Live, where you have a vertical set of four neighborhoods blending residential units with workplaces that bring collaboration and innovation among the folks that live in that building to engage and produce new ideas, innovative technology, and use all the tools we've been talking about and probably Martha also used crowdsourcing to get funding to get their innovations off the ground. One project, one building that's transferred from basically a uh, white collar workplace of the 70s, 80s to a no collar workplace of innovation and collaboration. So I should modify what I just said to say we'll be losing the folks online who are joining us by Facebook in about three Ten to minutes. four minutes. Nine minutes, okay. 
But we do have time to continue this here uh, for about another 15 or 20 minutes after that. So for the, so we have nine minutes. So let's just talk quickly about the cons. There seems to be a lot of uh, pros to smart cities, intelligent communities. But let's talk about concerns for security, safety, and privacy. What are some of those concerns right. we should be thinking about? Right. Well, first of all, uh, a positive I just want to mention of that Arlington has uh, tried to compete for this Intelligent Community Award on a global basis, and we've uh, been designated in the top seven uh, twice. Uh, but that is a wonderful resource that uh, in New York City, there's this uh, Intelligent Community Forum and they have the best practices of over 300 communities around the world, including the ones designated as the best in the world, and what they've done, positive and well, and also lessons learned and, and bad things. Uh, I mentioned earlier the uh, problem with the industrial control system, the SCADA system uh, that was controlling all of our uh, sewage, water, uh, traffic lights, and what have you, and it was not secure, mm. and that uh, a uh, hacker could have gone into the system and rerouted sewage into our water system, done lots of very bad things. Uh, so uh, there, there are things that we are trying to do to uh, maintain our community better, and that uh, the protection of the SCADA system is a key thing. We so often, when we talk about cybersecurity and security of systems, we forget about natural disasters and things that could go wrong there. Uh, I uh, actually uh, recently won an award uh, related to the work that I'm doing with regard to coronal mass ejections, in other words, massive solar storms that could come and uh, wipe out our power systems, our electronic grids, and what have you. Uh, and if something like the so-called Carrington event of 1859 uh, happened uh, today, in 1859, it set uh, telegraph offices on fire, but that was the only electronic systems out there. But if that happened today, it could be potentially a disastrous event. Uh, Lloyds of London did a study, and they projected that this could be a $3 trillion event, not billion, $3 trillion event and that uh, we could wipe out uh, the grid. And it isn't something that just happens uh, every so often, uh, every 100 years or so, that there was the Montreal event of uh, uh, 1989, there was the Halloween event in Scandinavia in 2003 that took out power systems uh, from these solar storms. What's particularly an issue is that the Earth's magnetic poles are flipping and that's what protects us from these solar storms and that some of the models indicate that our protective systems will go down to 15% of what they are today. So I'm working with people at NASA on the whole idea of a solar shield and uh, that's one of the reasons I got this award. But Congratulations. Anyway. Well, so um, <clears throat> with the smart city point of view, the biggest challenge is the cyber security. So if you really look at what's happening, there's a big transformation that is taking place across society, right? So if you're a city, what do cities, uh, what's their primary responsibility? Cities have two primary responsibilities as far as I'm concerned. One is to protect and serve the citizens. Another is to protect critical infrastructure. Those are the two primary roles of any city, okay? Uh, but see how that role, particularly with a critical infrastructure point of view in a smart city environment, is getting very complicated. So Jack has one of the best teams that I have seen any city has, not only in America, but in the world. And I have been to 82 countries in the last 19 years, build systems in 44 countries. So I'm speaking from experience. So you got, fundamentally in any city, you have three systems, right? You have IT <coughs> system, which is information technology systems. That's your databases are. That's where citizens' information resides, your tax information, your property information, your health information, very vital. And so with, with a smart city point of view, 
data protection is critical now. You know, 10 years ago, we were talking about data privacy. To me, data privacy is too complex. But I can achieve data privacy by protecting data, you know? So, so IT systems have to be protected. And then you got, like Joe said, what we call OT systems, operational technology, which is basically your SCADA base uh, systems that operates your trans traffic, your sewer system, water system, utilities. Almost every critical infrastructure is based on one very old system called SCADA. It's a very stable system, but it's an old system. Okay? And we have not made any changes in the system for a long time to come. But here is the real challenge begins. So these are the two traditional systems that that city manages. And now we're going to have a new system that is going to be called IoT, right? Internet of Everything system, which not only a standalone system in itself, but it also integrates both previous systems. So the complexity with security point of view increases by leaps and bound, right? And it's very challenging. So a smart city environment, you are heading toward, this is the bad side of it, some serious, you know, troubled water. Right? And it's not just the Russians and the Chinese. The threats are from everywhere. And most of the threats are internal, <laughs> not external. Unlike the, unlike the physical security, or the bad guys are not coming with guns to kill us from outside. A lot of cyber. Cyber is a human problem, not a technology problem. And people don't realize that. And we, you cannot solve cyber security problem just by buying more hardware and software. I have seen that isn't happen. And a total solution for cyber in my viewpoint is at least 20 to 25 years away. So we just have to manage it. We still are going to build a smart city, but we have to manage it. But you can see the complexity, how it increases once you go into this interconnected world with internet of things, driving everything, and, and with our point of view, you have seen nothing. The worst is yet to come. That's the bad side of it. Now, the, the hopeful note here, just so we don't uh, have the folks online leave us on that dire note, <laughs> is that we all have a role to play. And so that's where we as individuals can be proactive. Would you all agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. So, that's why the Civic Federation, the Committee 100, which is also meeting tonight, uh, uh, also Arlington Community for a Clean Environment is meeting across the street. We have more institutions, more commissions, schools, and county than any community I know per capita. It's like we're all Unitarians. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the, the point is that that is what makes Arlington unique and different and I think a great place to live is that network. And I think sometimes we take that for granted that what we call the Arlington Way uh, is, is what it is. But I couldn't agree more that how we continue to engage, expand, and focus that engagement in very strategic ways is going to be uh, central to uh, how we plan for and how we implement our smart county. So one of the questions that Beverly put for us is, how would Arlington look like in 2050, right? Exactly, the art of the possible. So I have created a Arlington 2050 model for you, okay? And if I have time, you do have I'd time. Like to we'll, share. we'll just bid goodbye to the folks online. Oops. And Jack, you have a question as well. So, are there any questions from online audience? Okay. 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 So this is a living on a good note, not a bad note, because you told me that. <laughs> So this is how I think Arlington will look like in 2050, and you should be proud of it. So the Arlington will be a leading a smart city and a national model that others will follow, okay? It will have a smart school, a smart hospital and clinics, a smart airport, a smart transportation, and a well-connected smart community. Now, Arlington is blessed. You have airport, you have universities, you have hospital, you have everything. But nothing is as smart. I, I'm sorry to say that, but it will be, okay? 
Okay, there is another one. It will have one of the lowest crime rates in the country and will be an ideal place to raise family. That's Arlington 2050. It will have 80% plus citizen participation in the democratic process, critical, without interference from Russians and Chinese. <laughs> so the systems will, be, systems will be robust to really protect you against that. It will be one of the most diversified communities in the nation. Arlington already is a very diversified community, but it will remain so, and it will be a stronger. Arlington will continue to lead regional security and safety, which Arlington does right now, and it will present a proven model for other regions of the country. So Arlington truly will be a national model. And finally, Arlington will become an innovation city, okay? That will lead how small counties can really develop and grow and live in peace and harmony. That's, that's how I see Arlington 2050 under the broad umbrella of a smart city. So to wrap up, <clears throat> I have one, <clears throat> to wrap up, we're gonna do a lightning round here. <laughs> and the lightning round is, um, you're gonna get two minutes to answer this question, right? So it's 10 years from now, 2028. What's the one thing, reflecting back on this event tonight, that you wish you had said or emphasized or made known to the audience? The one, one thing. Hmm. Who wants to go first? Um, <coughs> Joe will go first. Oh, thank, you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Andy. <laughs> well, uh, let me start by saying, emphasizing something that I, I said, that we have this uh, remarkable resource in terms of Connect Arlington, uh, but it uh, has not reached the potential that it should have gotten. Uh, on one hand, uh, it can be a resource to the business community uh, and to the government uh, to provide uh, illuminating the dark fiber for uh, private use. Uh, even uh, Verizon could uh, use that resource more effectively. And we have not done enough in that regard. Uh, the, uh, we have a world-class uh, uh, series of hospitals here, but they have not really uh, looked into and uh, uh, used that resource for telemedicine and telehealth. And I know I've worked uh, in projects uh, around the world, uh, from Scandinavia, the Caribbean, and Africa, in terms of telehealth uh, applications, so just for training, in addition to uh, providing uh, medical services. There's a great potential there that we have not realized. And then finally, the school system. I think the school system uh, has done a great job in terms of providing excellent schools for Arlington, but that they have not really uh, got the message about how much can be done to uh, let uh, our high school students get college credit and take uh, four credit uh, courses uh, for, uh, from uh, using the resources we have here uh, across the county for education uh, and uh, for training of teachers and uh, many other applications that could be in the educational field. So I think that uh, we have been fortunate to get this uh, grant from the U.S. Uh, Department of Transportation to put in this smart system. And uh, uh, we are one of the few communities that has this type of uh, really uh, broadband power, and we have not yet put it to its full uh, use and uh, application. Jack, I'm gonna talk about two things very quickly. And one, we didn't talk about housing. And uh, we, I talked about the workplace of the future, retailing, autonomous vehicles, and so on. But I didn't talk about housing for a number of reasons. And this county has been committed to ensuring, and we talked about diversity a lot tonight, ensuring we have a diverse population. To do that, we need to continue to stay on point 
in advancing opportunities for affordable housing, not just for low and moderate income, those households at 60 or 80 percent of, of the area median income, but those that make up the missing middle, those at 100 or 120 percent of AMI. That is where we're really challenged. And the county board has established an affordable housing master plan and a set of implementation strategies that we're implementing. And we're working in partnerships there as well with not-for-profit and for-profit housing providers to try to meet our goal of preserving hundreds of units, creating hundreds of units for housing a year. We're going to have to continue to look for alternative ways maybe even crowdsourcing, to find ways to fund and support affordable house in Arlington. Lastly, uh, we talked about this building and its transition into really a smart place to work, innovative place to work. You can't do that without great people, a great workforce. Uh, and we're very fortunate in Arlington, you're very fortunate in Arlington that, that your staff, uh, the men and women who, who are committed to delivering services, uh, to supporting every aspect of life in Arlington are some of the best in the country. I've worked across the country in planning in a number of, of areas, and this workforce is one of the strongest. And I have to have a shout out for our planning staff. We have one of the smartest, one of the most dedicated, committed group of planners in this region, maybe across the country, that are committed to this concept of smart city and planning, and uh, we won't get there with that type of workforce and that type of planning. Okay. So I'm going to get a little philosophical here. <laughs> I, I see a smart city in Arlington's future, but here is my caution when you set out to build your smart city. Most new technologies are very disruptive in nature today, and they will continue to be so. So selecting the technology for your smart city and smart city solution is, is very important. And they should, they should, including this smart city whole vision and concept of smart city, they should reflect on the cultural value and the lifestyle of the community. Don't get carried away, carried away because the technologies are very seductive. I've been in this business a long time. And they can force you to do things that you do not necessarily want to. And that's where the smartness comes in planning, okay? So protecting cultural values of the community and the lifestyle is very important as you modernize yourself through a smart city. Beverly. How about uh, you? Oh, okay, I, I get to answer this. So I, I think I'm going to weigh in a bit philosophical as well. And uh, you know, my feeling is that s smart technology or technology in general really amplifies who we are as a society. And if we're going to survive on, on this rock that's kind of hurtling through <coughs> space and time, we really have to take care of each other. We have to do that. And so as we build advanced technologies, we really have to make sure that they're consistent with our core compassionate values. We have to have compassionate core values. Because it doesn't really matter, you know, if you're, we're talked a lot about artificial intelligence and we talked about advanced technologies that will limit or eliminate humans in the loop. But as we build these technologies and we stay consistent to those values, then I think we'll find that uh, we are humanity. The technology will then uh, showcase our, our humanity. It will amplify those core values. I think we have to pay attention to that. Well, we want to thank Beverly. Joe, thank you so much, Bob. You. And the audience, the, audience. the audience. Thank you so much for tonight. I want to thank my staff who have been here, Holly Otto, and all the work that she's done with us to make this happen tonight. June the 6th, we're going to have our next event. It's going to be on the future of work and along the lines of what we just talked about here. If you look at our educational system right now, our colleges and universities, we're producing kids that are coming out and they have debts 
that we didn't have when we went to college. And it'll take them 10 to 12 years to work those debts down. They say 57% of the occupations that we know of today are going to be disrupted in the next five years. Automation's taking place everywhere. What are we going to do? How do we get, how do we make sure we have the right skill sets to be able to work in the workforce? The majority of kids graduating from college look back and say, it wasn't worth the time I spent in four years of getting a degree. We, the whole mindset we have is you learn to work. You go to school, to find a job. And maybe we're turning that paradigm around, turning the sock inside out. Maybe it's about learning to work. And so we're going to talk about that on June the 6th. It's going to be at the Allenton Central Library. Again, thank you all for coming out on this cold and windy night. Thank you. Well, thanks. It's a good program. Great program. Great. Good to meet you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.